Hey everybody, welcome to the Dreamer's Edge podcast. With Nicholas, I'm the gaming correspondent for Idiomatic. And I am Dimitri, uh, editor-in-chief of Idiomatic and movie critic. Now you may be wondering, where's the rest of the crew? How come it's the don't fuck with the original uh, guys here? Well, that's because we've taken over. Yep, we rule. Now, back when Star Trek Into Darkness, No Call, and One Breath came out, we talked about the Star Trek movies, and then the Star Trek The Next Generation movies, and over at Don't F with the original, we talked about the original series, as well as the reboot by J.J. Abrams, but what we haven't talked about is a TV series from the 90s. I know. And now that the DVD for Star Trek Into Darkness, No Call, and One Breath is coming out, we thought it'd be the perfect occasion to come back and talk about the next generation and all of its awesome spin-offs. Yes. Awesome is a strong word for these, but yes. <laughs> but we've got a lot of material to get through, so let's not waste any time and start with Star Trek The Next Generation. They don't say that. I don't know why they did that. Star Trek The Next Generation. Yes. Now, that one is a weird one because it started off with Gene Roddenberry reviving his series for ABC with a brand new crew in the 80s. Yeah. With a, a fairly old captain, where like I, yeah. I did not expect that at the time. Yeah, well, he's a captain. Captains, you get that by promotion, so expect them to be older. If for the action stuff, they had the first officer. Exactly, which, which was a sort of a normal concept, yeah, though. Exactly, yeah. you know, it's, it, you know, it wasn't like all the same three characters all the time. You know, each different characters had different storylines. Yeah, and he's still going with the uh, acceptance thing. Like we have a female officer who's chief of security, who's essentially their action star, and she yeah. was a woman. Yeah. And, and a, a, a woman that was built like she could handle herself, which was a great casting choice. Yeah. And it's too bad she didn't want to stay. Indeed. Um, you have a robot, mm -hmm. Data, who's discovering humanity. So he's sort of a, the voice with which the other characters can share the enlightenment yeah. with without feeling as condescending to the audience as it might have otherwise. Yeah. Uh, he had, the, you know, a counselor that could feel emotions. So it was basically a crutch for bad writers to, you know... I know you are feeling this instead of having the characters be <laughs> able to express what he feels. You are feeling this now. Can uh, I just say, everybody slams Wesley Crusher, whom we'll get to in an instant. Yeah. But for me, she is the worst character in oh, the series. Oh, she's terrible. She's terrible. And, and it's not the actress's fault. I think no. the actress is fine. It's just, it's such a bad idea for a character. Yeah. You know, make the extra effort and have your character be able to express by, you know actions or even words and tone of voice how they're feeling not have the other characters saying you are angry right now there's one funny scene where you know she goes to a clean and that I'm, I'm sensing a lot of anger from you and he's like oh you can't say that because you're telepathic he's like no from the table you broke it's like have characters break tables all the time if they're angry you don't need her at all although honestly <laughs> if, if, if 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 the crew was full of people who kept breaking furniture in the ship i'd be like i don't think you're as enlightened as you think you are <laughs> yeah good point <laughs> Um, and it was really clutter. They did a little kid that was, you know, growing up. You know, he gets to learn about the problems that adults have, you know. And he has that sort of um, teenage uh, willfulness about him. Yeah. Sort of not really realizing that you need to stop and think sometimes. Yeah. But he's also a genius. So when he doesn't stop and think, it's, sometimes it's because he thought faster than the, the other characters. Yeah. Uh, I Everybody was, slams him, but I was like, hey, he's, he's, he's there. He's there, exactly. <laughs> Um, you had the blind guy, the blind uh, guy from Reading Rainbow. I don't know how he could read if he's blind, but whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> that seemed like a cruel joke, Gene Roddenberry. When I was younger. I wonder how how does that guy see? And my first, he's not really blind. No, I know he's not blind, but he has this giant thing on his eyes. How does the actor see and be able to make it? <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I think there are little holes in that thing. So yeah, you could must, have, must have been hell for the guy though. Still, <laughs> you know? yeah. Well, that's why in the movies they gave him something else because yeah. they were like. Yeah, I'm tired of wearing that Doki thing that keeps falling off. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, it's very 80s, too. It's yeah, very 80s. That is true. Oh, yeah. And there's, uh, of course, uh, Wesley's mother, the yeah. doctor. Yeah. I like her a lot, actually. Yeah. and But apparently she, she wasn't working out. Apparently somebody didn't like her, so they replaced her with uh, an older doctor that every fan shat on. So they brought back Dr. Crusher. Oh, yeah. The, the blonde woman with yeah. the... Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. She wasn't there long, was she? No. She, people hated her character so much that, you know, they wrote in and it's like, okay, no, we're bringing back Beverly Crusher. It's good. It's good. Yeah, but Beverly Crusher is like Wesley's mother. Like, yeah. she has a reason to be there beyond being the doctor. Yeah. Also, she's pretty. Yeah. 
And there was Worf as well. We forget Worf. Oh, we forgot Worf. Uh, who's a Klingon. Yeah. Um, uh, who was raised by humans. So he's an adopted child and yeah. has sort of uh, the anxieties that come with that. And he's an interesting character because, again, it was written by Gene Roddenberry, uh, who was very firm about the idea that humans have evolved beyond interpersonal conflict. Yeah. Which is like, um, that's the source of drama in all fiction. So you're, you're sort of tying your writer's hands together. Yeah, well, you need to get the drama from other species. Basically. Exactly, and that's what Worf was there. He's yeah. like, I'm an adopted child, and I have feelings about that, and they're interesting, and I can express them because I'm not human. Yeah. Um, but the first two years, which were helmed by Roddenberry, are awful. Oh, they're terrible. You could see they're recycled, like, original series cast. Like, mm. Riker fighting stuff, or just... It, 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 they're very bad. After his passing, then the show got good. Yeah. And I know I sound like a jerk for putting it that way, but uh, fact. Yes. I don't know what. Did they get better writers or something? Or did writers weren't tied... Their hands weren't tied by his vision? I think that's what it is. Because suddenly, the characters started fighting a little bit amongst themselves. A little bit. Like, suddenly, yeah. Picard was like, I'm a badass. Yeah. And and number one goes like, I don't agree with what you're doing. I'm a badass. You will do what I tell you. Yeah. And, and and that made it fun. Like, suddenly, like, the fact that the characters didn't really agree with one another. I mean, they still respected the idea of, like, they all treat each other well yeah. and politely and as maturely as you could reasonably expect from a flawed human being. But yeah. you could see their flaws popping out a little bit more. Yeah. And even they, they had, like, flawed characters. Like, I remember Lieutenant Barkley. When you he's introduced, he, he he basically spends his time on on the holodeck, basically what, living out fantasies of him beating up his superiors because he has like this complex, and you know it, it was a fun episode where you know it's like you no know, you, you need to you know go see the counselor and you know work through that and make make friends on the ship and you know solve your problems and then it was a fun episode and I don't think that character would have existed if Rudner no. had been there you know yeah, for sure. Um, Oh yeah, it's a show that introduced the holodeck, the freaking holodeck. Yeah, where half the episodes were filmed, you know, because you know, a, a, a ship in the future with modern technology is boring. You have to, you know, have the characters dress up in modern day clothing and you know live out Sherlock Holmes for some reason. To some degree, it's their version of the original series constant time travel. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, we want a different setting because visually we're getting sort of like enough of the jumpsuits. Yeah. Uh, but instead of doing all that time travel, which becomes increasingly unlikely, we'll just do the holodeck thing. Yeah. Which is like, no, do the time travel thing because the time travel thing has real stakes. The holodeck thing doesn't. Well, well, sometimes they could die in the holodecks when the securities were off. So there were some stakes sometimes. Yeah, but then he's an idiot. Like, you know, it's like this weird thing. It's like, if your toy keeps trying to kill you, stop playing with it. Like, I yeah. don't. <laughs> Good point. That'd be tantamount to, like, a mother going like, Hey, I got you the Chucky doll back. <laughs> like, no, stop. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah. You know, you could see the episodes getting better and better. And, you know. They introduced the Borg. The Borg, yes. Basically, it, you know. I'm not quite sure what the Borg was signifying. Some people was like the fear of technology. Some people were saying, you know, the fear of communism. <laughs> it was like, which one was it? I've heard both. It could be both. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have attached it to communism. I I think that's simplistic. I think that's a really warped vision of communism yeah i think it was meant more as this really insane sort of uh, blow your mind sci-fi concept the idea of lost individuality yeah and basically you know technology taking over yeah you're no longer human you're basically the technology controls you and basically technology is one so you're all one mind because of it because mm. and, and they explain it it's such a sort of surreal bizarre way where it's sort of like no, no, it's not that you lose your personality and you become a tool to that entity. Yeah. No, no, you become part of the collective. You still exist. You're just not one anymore, which is sort of like, I don't I don't yeah. know how that works, but that's the beauty of the concept. It's sort of beyond my imagination. Exactly. And good thing they didn't do that, but they were supposed to basically, the Borg, they were supposed to go all the way back to Star Trek, the motion picture. Basically, at the end, when the the guy commutes with the the, the girl robot, that was they, they said it was supposed to be the beginning of the Borg, and that's where they came from. And I was like, no, that would have been awful. Good thing you didn't go for that. I don't think I would have hated it, but I would have been like, eh, it's a waste. It's a waste of a good, you know, 
I was like, yeah, no, that's weird. That's just weird. No, don't go there. Yeah, in fairness, I didn't like where they went with it in uh, First Contact uh, in terms of the origins of the Borg either. So I sort of uh, like, there was no origin. It was mostly the Borg Queen. Yeah, I have major qualms with yeah. that. The finale. I want yeah. to talk about the series finale of that because it was fantastic. Yes. The series finale of Star Trek The Next Generation is by far their best episode, and it was great. Yeah. I mean, some people say that the, the, the Borg, when the Borg attack, or is the, is the better one. It, it's a, it's between the two, but yeah, the, I love the finale. The finale yeah. is probably one of the best finales I have seen in any series. Yeah, absolutely. That is it, a very good point. Yeah, it is it's spectacular. You can see, you know, it's basically Q, which is an unimportant entity that kind of messes with Picard, tries to, you know see if his ma- mind has expanded throughout the seven years, and basically he warps him through the past, the, the first episode, the present now is, and the future. Mm. And he basically has to solve like a mystery of what's happening. It's almost kind of a clip show done right, because you, yeah. you can see the original crew back yeah. in the first one, and you know they actually put the effort of making people look like they, <laughs> they were supposed to. Um, and then the future, you know, and then it was spectacular. And, and, and they went to the origins of Earth and all that, like yeah. all these white, crazy uh, sci-fi concept done so well, and like yeah. all binded together by one character, yeah, uh, Captain John Picard and his humanity. Because what it is is Q is testing Picard's humanity essentially. Q's going like, "Did you evolve beyond humanity?" Because humanity is kind of petty and stupid by yeah, my standards exactly did you evolve uh, beyond that and picard sort of grasping to his humanity is like yeah it's petty but it's who i am i'm not yeah. letting go of that yeah. and it's such a fascinating philosophical conflict throughout all the crazy but he, he wanted to see if he could expand his mind yeah which which you know which happened but i love the part like in the future where picard's trying to convince people that he's not senile and crazy mm-hmm. which you know kind of a hard sell you yeah. know and they even add the humor of Q just being a jackass. You know, you get to ask me, you know, 10 questions, yes or no questions. And at what point Picard asks why? He's like, that's not a yes or no question. You forfeit the rest of your questions. <laughs> it's like him being a jackass again. It was like a perfect, you know, ending. He's a great character and they bring him back. It was, you know, yeah. really funny. And he's a kind of character that was introduced in the pilot. Exactly. And who stated that he would be monitoring these characters to see how far along their culture has got. Yeah. And then at the end, of the series he puts the final test to see how far their culture has got exactly. which gives you a sense of like okay that is one full seven year story that yeah. we got exactly and uh and again it ties back to the original star trek message because one of my qualms with star trek's the next generation is that it's less humanity can do everything more than technology can do everything it's, it's yeah. much more science is awesome than humans are awesome. that is true which is fine. I mean, it's 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 yeah. it's a new series. It can have a different message, mm. but the the finale sort of tied it all back to humanity, where it's sort of like, well, yeah, science is an expansion of how far along we've gotten and in, of our personal growth. But is there a cost to that personal growth? Like, is there some things that we should let go of and some things we should let go of? And mm. that's a genuine debate to have when you're. Uh, trying to excel and improve yourself and that ties to the Borg as well and everything it's yeah like, okay why well, you've managed to condense all of those seven years of holodecks and references to the original and Borgs and all of that into yeah. one cohesive statement and I'm like kudos bravo yeah yeah especially since like all the different writers the guy that wrote the finale that brought everything together I was like wow it's well, well played yeah yeah you know? uh. uh. Um, Deep Space Nine, that is a series that, in retrospect, might have been a bad idea from the get-go. Here's my thing with it. The concept, I'll let you do it. It's basically, um, Captain Sisko is assigned to a space station, uh, near Bajor. Bajor uh, is a planet that had been occupied by Cardassians. Now the Cardassians have, you know, freed them. (laughs) Sorry, the Cardassians. No, Card- Cardassians, not the Kardashians. That'd be terrible. Oh my god. <laughs> Everybody on, on Bajor would kill himself if the Kardashians were ruling. Um, <laughs> no, no, the, but... the, the whole system would have imploded, I'm pretty <laughs> yes. sure. So it, it's basically um, Cisco uh, going there. They want to get the Bajor into the Federation, but he's basically there to m- m- facilitate their new independence. Yeah. And basically it's a p- powder keg and it's ready to blow every episode. Exactly. It is. It, it's, it's a co-weight metaphor. Is what it is. Yeah. 
yeah, it's more of a Middle, East, Middle Eastern thing. You yeah, know? it's a Middle Eastern thing. Back in the day, yeah. Kuwait was the big thing at the, t- at yeah. the time that we were talking about. So yeah. I always associated with that particular conflict. Yeah. Although the difference is that the Federation didn't leave them out to dry. But yeah. <laughs> Um, but what it is, it's, yeah, like you say, it's a Middle Eastern, uh, metaphor. And I, and I love the first two years of that series back when I watched it because it played that metaphor yeah. to the hilt. Yeah. It's basically the Federation or, you know, in the metaphor E, the USA yeah. trying to, you know, solve the differences between war and fascism and doing the wrong thing every time. Yes. And making the situation worse. And at the same time, keeping just a little bit of that Star Trek spirit yeah. in the sense that all of the people involved that are backstabbing each other, like there's this terrific uh, uh, Cardassian... Um, Taylor. Taylor. Garrick. He's such a great... He's the best character. character. He's one of the best characters in, in, in the whole Star Trek universe. Yeah. And he's he's playing everyone like a fiddle. And he's like such a bastard about it. But at the same time... His goal is the same as the Bajorians, and everything. he wants peace. Yeah, and he's going to get it by manipulating the Federation if he has to. But yeah. he is going to ensure that the that the kettle doesn't blow up. Yeah, in in the later episode and in later later seasons, that he he basically brings the Romulan into an alliance by basically ma- making one of their ships explode and killing a bunch of people. And he has his whole plan. Cisco is angry because people die, and was like, "But think of my plan. It's going to work. It's going to save lives." And Cisco is just like. Yeah, you're right. And he's really angry, but he sees that the guy is such a manipulator, but so brilliant at the same time. I, I love that character. <laughs> yeah, he's great. And the fact that he has a noble goal, yeah. you know, and, and he's doing the evil things, but the right things. Yeah. And it's just so murky. And it's, 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 it's fantastic. And also Quark as well. Yeah. You know, he tries to be the Ferengi, like the really... Uh, greedy. Greedy guy. But then he, he still kind of loves this heart of gold and he still ends up doing like... He does the right thing, and he 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 he's like, oh, it's gonna cost me, and he's gonna get get into trouble for not being Ferengi enough, not following the rules of acquisition. But all right, fine, you know, I'm gonna do it because you know, stupid humans have influenced <laughs> me. <laughs> you know, fun character as well. Yeah, no, I mean that show had full good bad characters. I like Dax. I don't care what anybody says. I like Dax. She she's essentially a, a, a young supermodel who shares. Her being with uh, her, uh, essentially a, a parasite tri- ancestor. Yeah, it's called a trill. Yeah. Yeah. Who allows her to have access to great wisdom of the ages, but she's still herself at the same time. So she still has slightly immature impulses because she's a fairly young person. Yeah. Uh, she's in love with the doctor. At the beginning, she, but then she goes, she ends up with Worf. Spoiler. Yeah. Yeah, Worf, Worf gets every piece of tail. Yeah. Like that's yeah. She's weird. Let's face it. Uh, but the Doctor, but in the first two years, the coupling worked really well because the Doctor was the opposite of her character. He's this super genius character who can do all of these things. Like, he's yeah. just a naturally gifted person. But, you know, he, he's just a man, and he's sort of a particularly insecure man <laughs> Yeah, that. Yeah. Which is fun. Uh, then you... Who o- else? O'Brien. Hey, O'Brien. Hey. Chief O'Brien that came from the Enterprise. It was a cool character, you know. He's like the transporter chief that could do anything with transporters, and they bring him back to be engineer there. Really fun, you know. Really, really fun addition. The guy, the, the, the Kong Miri, I think his name is, yeah. the actor. Yeah, and he plays sort of the voice of reason in there because the, the idea in that in that series <laughs> yes. that Cisco is knee deep into crap and doesn't know how to get the hell out of there, and he keeps just like, I mean, he's a smart person. He's just in a situation where, he, well, he's he's in the Kobamaru situation, yeah, pretty much. And O'Brien is sort of like this guy, just like this nuts and bolts sort of wisdom, going like, "All right, calm the fuck down." <laughs> One character I was disappointed in was Kira. And yeah. the pilot, she wanted independence for Bajo. She didn't want to pay Federation in. She just, she, she fought off the, the, the Cardassians. So she she's not going to welcome the Federation, you know, to rule them instead. And, you know, she's like, no, we can do our, our stuff on our own. And all of a sudden, the second episode, she just mellows out. And she's she loves Cisco. And it's like, no, no, come on. Be, be consistent a little bit. Yeah, no, I agree. I, and I think that conflict was more interesting than anything. Yeah. Especially since she had control of the station in the sense of she was the one with the relationship with all the natives. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and that was cool. Like her relationship with the Metamorph, whose name I forget. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. The, his, her, uh, Otto was a fascinating character. He hates yeah. everyone, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and Except her. Except her, exactly. And, and so if she had been difficult to deal with, 
that relationship he has with her would have been all the more important. Yeah. But yeah, they, they, I guess I don't know. It didn't test properly. The people didn't like that character. It's like, no, she's gonna be just trouble or something. So they changed her. But it's like, I, you know, I, I was looking forward to that conflict. And in the second episode, of a sudden, she's like, oh, hey, hey, commander, what do you want? What do you want me to do today? You know, yeah. I shall obey your orders. It's just, uh... yeah. but yeah, it's a great concept for a series. Yeah. My only issue with it is that it's sort of '90s cynicism, sort of sneaking into. The Star Trek purity. Yeah. It is. It, it, this is a very pessimistic show. That is true, and and that's my only issue with it. But it's a major one for me. And so, even when they started retooling the show, because I think that cynicism was a little too subtle for the Star Trek audience. Yeah. Um, and started introducing the Dominion and all of that stuff. And yeah. It actually got more cynical instead of less. And yeah, it was thousands weird. of thousands of people dying. That's not yeah. what you watch Star Trek for, you know. Yeah. It's it was very bad, you know. They you had until the Dominion. It, you still had some fun stuff going on. Mm. I loved when they went to the mirror universe. Yes, and all the characters were just completely. They they just played it crazy. They pretty <laughs> much told the actors just go wild. You're free. You do whatever you want. And the, the actors who played Kira played were so slutty. It was hilarious. <laughs> it was oh my funny. god. Well, it goes well with the idea because that they're all wind up so tight in that yeah. show, especially in the first seasons, because every move they make could cause war and cause thousands and thousands of deaths. So yeah. everybody's being hyper vigilant about everything that they're doing. Yeah. And so when they go into the universe where they're just evil, so they don't care, you, yeah. it's almost get a sense of like, what is it they really feel? And it's like, well, one wants to bone an awful lot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> wants to scream his head and kill everyone. <laughs> oh, man. Those were fun. But yeah, it, it, I don't know. Looking back at it, you know, the first seasons are good. And if you like the, the conflict stuff, like the more action packed, the later seasons are good with the conflict with the Dominion. It, I guess some people were still complaining that they didn't like the political stuff and not enough stuff's happening. Yeah, that's, that was the complaint, yeah. So that's why they did the Dominion stuff in, in, the, in the later years. I, I appreciate both parts. You know, you just have to curve your expectations saying, okay, starting now, it's, it's a different show. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm fine with that. You know, I'd rather a series keep its tone toward the whole thing, but I could enjoy both of them. I have to say, I have a strong preference for the first two seasons because it was tackling something much more ambitious, both tonally and in terms of its message and in terms of originality. There was no other show like it at the time. Yeah. Um, and then they went into something a little bit less ambitious, and it's always it it breaks my heart a little bit when you see creators go like. Uh, look, I, we got to stay employed, so uh, let's throw the big ideas in the garbage can and let's do the thing that everybody knows. Yeah, it, it breaks your heart a little bit. Yeah, uh, but in terms of how they did it, though, they did it well. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's it's a solid show throughout. Okay, let's do Voyager. Uh, Voyager, um, basically, new spaceship captain by a scientist this time. You know, not the captain's a scientist. That's the new cool thing. And uh, they're sent into the Delta Quadrant. Where Wait, the captain's a scientist, but she's a woman. I know. And this portion of the podcast was brought to you by Fox News. Sorry. <laughs> they're sent to the Delta Quadrant. And to add to the, the, the mess of that, they, a lot of the crew dies. And there's also a Maquis ship that was trying to take over the new you know, ship Voyager. Yeah, the Maquis are a bunch of terrorists who are anti-Federation. Yeah, because the Federation is basically doing very bad dealings for peace you know with the Cardassians that they're giving out home worlds where people are living there and it's like no this world is Cardassian now and that well humans are living there you can't abandon them and they basically form the Maquis yeah, and another great concept that comes from DS9 the idea that the terrorists aren't evil exactly they, they're just defending you know their homes hmm. and it's like it's a good concept so the Maquis is trying to take out Voyager and they're stranded in the Delta Quadrant as well so you basically have a crew of half Maquis half Starfleet that have to work together to get back to the Gamma Quadrant. Mm. So it's essentially uh, Lost in Space, but with Star Trek characters. Yeah. Uh, they introduced a cool concept, which is two enemy factions stuck together in that Lost in Space context, which yeah. would have been great if they had decided to play off it instead of just shoving it under the carpet at episode two. Oh, episode six. Maybe. But yeah, no. <laughs> and then they bring out they bring it back a few times once in a while. You know, when the writers don't know what to do to complete the season. Well, let's have them go back to being maquis and crazy. But yeah, you're right. It's like Chicote and Janeway were the two captains. Yeah. One uh Chicote is with the Maquis, Janeway's with the Federation. Okay. Uh Janeway is a uh is a rationalist. Yeah. 
Chikore is more of a spiritual person. Yeah. They constructed the character so that they would constantly butt heads. You could see that was the concept in the pilot. Yeah. They made two polar opposites, but two noble characters. Yeah, exactly. And then Chikote just went like, well, I'm going to bend over and take whatever Jaywee gives me. Exactly. The only time he, he kind of argues is what, who's going to be chief engineer? Mm. And he's like, well, no, my chief engineer is the best, you know. He, she, 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 and she, she's like, I'm not going to have a chief engineer that was a Maquis. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to be your only Maquis officer. And that's, I think, the only time I remember them really butting heads. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the, the conflicts really comes from, like, other people in the crew, especially a, a character named Seska, only in the first season, who she was actually a Cardassian in disguise, infiltrated the Maquis. Yeah, I remember that. She... She was in a bad position because she was stuck with all these people in the Delta Quadrant. <laughs> She's a Kardashian. She has nothing to do there, but she really causes trouble because she wants to get, you know, screw the Federation and the rules. We're going to make trades and try and get there as fast, fast as possible. And she created a conflict. Unfortunately, got rid of her. It's kind of lame, but, yeah. you know, they, she had to move on, I guess. <laughs> Uh, what the show did instead is play off uh, their uh, their version of Han Solo uh, in Paris. Yeah. Uh, who looked like a young Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> I guess, yeah. If you look at him, it was like, yeah. oh, you're Ryan Reynolds without the muscles. Uh, <laughs> oh. um, and man, did they play that card over and over again. Paris is cool. Paris can't be trusted, except he always can be. Yeah. Uh, Paris. And then there was other characters that were kind of, you know, they were okay. The, the main addition was really Seven of Nine that came in like season Three or four, I think. Yeah, and then the show started getting pretty good, actually. Yeah. It was basically... Because they had to go through Borg space. And we know Borgs are badass from, you know, the next generation. And they had to go through a space filled with Borg ships. So, you know, stuff started getting serious. And Seven of Nine, you know, Jerry Ryan, you know, you, people don't give her credit because she has, she has giant... Giant, whatever. <laughs> She's well endowed. Yes. But she is a tremendous actress. And Fantastic. She, she played that role so well. And she made all episodes that were focusing on her, which were like most of them at this point, because they realized where the talent was, uh, they were spectacular episodes. Yeah. They were very good. Yeah, no, and, and here's the thing. She's, she's playing a Borg who's starting to gain independent thought, yeah. like a way, like disconnected from the collective. And it's, it's, it's sort of a very layered performance that she gets. She actually plays the details of the implications of such a phenomenon. I got to see it in syndication. Yeah. And so I got to see her performance uh, on a daily basis. Yeah. And she actually modifies slightly. Like, she mellows out her character slowly and slowly. Yeah. And it's, it's it's just such a studied performance she gives for what is often remembered, as you pointed out, as a fan service role, which it's not. It's not. It's really not. It's it's unfortunate because she, she, she pretty much stole the show for the latter half of that series. Mm. No, and yeah, the character is so much fun because yeah. she's a badass. And, yes. And she's also the one character that you really can't trust because <laughs> she sort of has conflicting agendas. Exactly. Another character of note was a doctor. Basically he was the, fun. He was the comic relief, you know. They're in the Delta Quarant, kind of dark situation. Well, let's, let's just add this giant comic relief guy. Just looking at the guy, Robert Picard, you just laugh, you know. He's, <laughs> he's great. He yeah. plays it really well. He plays it really great. And, you know, the, the, the doctor also evolves his program, you know, because it's running so far. He starts learning stuff. And, you know, he, he's, he's a fun character, too. Yeah. I'm clearly inspired by Red Dwarf, but... Yeah. He he becomes the guide of seven of nine to humanity. It's kind of like the blind meaning the blind at this point. It is really it's really good. It is yeah no, and 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 the show turns into this really big action packed type show. Yes, like it was the Star Trek show where it's like we don't do the talking, we do the shooting. Exactly for a captain that's supposed to be the scientist, you know, she could have just made her commando, you know, seriously. <laughs> uh and, but the action scenes were cool. Like the, yeah. I, I remember episodes where the uh, their their ship gets torn in half. And oh stuff yeah, like that. It's they get, so cool. They get you know, especially the first year where they really like really fish out of war. There, they don't know what what what's what. They have no experience of the double horn. They get destroyed. They get mm. pounded. Yeah, uh, it's 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 a fun show. It's shallow. It is so shallow. Yeah, but uh, it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. You know. I think out of the Star Trek shows that we've mentioned so yeah. far, it's certainly the lesser one, but it's still imminently watchable. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, we're not going to talk about Enterprise. We're just no. not going to talk no. about Enterprise. En Enterprise does not exist. It's um, I enjoyed the series and before it started getting serious, and then it became a pain. It yeah, it went from train wreck to sort of just bad. Yeah. 
Yeah. I enjoyed the trainer part. I was like, this is so campy. This is hilarious. And then, like, terrible. Then they, they try and make a serious storyline with, like, the Earth is going to get destroyed. They need to stop it. And I was like, oh, this is terrible. And then the last season, they tried to three or four different storylines, linking a bunch of stuff in the, the Star Trek universe that did not need to be linked, like Khan and Data. You know, you need to link those two together somehow. Or, you know, Klingons without ridges from the first series and Data, because they need to be linked. Uh, <laughs> it's, it, it was just, what are you doing? And then, at least the finale, really, you know, oh, it's Candy again. This is awesome. <laughs> the finale was just, again... I, <laughs> probably the best finales of a series but on the opposite spectrum of next generation it was like oh wow this is not a train wreck this is like five trains colliding together and I have to watch <laughs> um, um, okay look I haven't watched a single episode of this thing no. I, I didn't want to like nothing about it looked interesting and here's the thing like we've been talking about this for a while now and I am not a Trekkie or a Trekker. Yeah. And as you might have noticed, I'm actually knowledgeable about all the movies yeah. and I know the series, but I, I didn't have that drive of going like, oh, oh is this Star Trek related? No, I'll watch it. No, no, it had to look good for me to give yeah. it a chance and it didn't. Oh, it, it really set the tone early in the first episode with the you know decontamination scene where they had to, you know, a hot guy in the, the Vulcan hot shake had to rub jelly on their bodies. And it was like, wow, this is where the series is going right now, <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, what did, what did you expect from UPN? Like, honestly, That's like UPN point. sort of skis really low. The hot Vulcan chick, which was hot for her assets, you know, and not her <laughs> acting capacity. You're supposed to be emotionless. And it was like, you can't do that, apparently. They had to give her a disease that gave her emotions because it was just so bad. <laughs> That's weird. Like, why don't you just replace the actor at that point? Like, just kill off the character or it could generate some drama out of she it. She was and hot. Like... Yeah, but there are other hot women. Yeah, but... And there are hot women that can act. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you, you bring back Jerry Ryan somehow. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you look like a Borg. No, I'm a Vulcan. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I went back in time with the first contact Borgs and... Uh, <laughs> I survived. Yeah. And I've been hanging out all this time. And now I'm part of the Enterprise crew. <laughs> I'm here to study the effect of my own paradox. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would watch that. <laughs> mild spoiler. If you if you are a fan of The Next Generation, you have to just catch the finale where... The finale of Enterprise is an episode of The Next Generation. <laughs> Which doesn't even make sense in the context of the Next Generation series. It completely breaks, you know, an episode. And they have old Riker and old Deanna Troy that don't even look like characters from the Next Generation playing them. It is so funny. It is, it's like, watch it with friends. It is hilarious. If you like those kinds of train wrecks, watch the finale. Wow. So that's it for the Star Trek universe. We had to end with Enterprise, unfortunately. It was still a funny end. <laughs> I guess it was. <laughs> if you have any questions, comments, thoughts about Star Trek The Next Generation... No, it still doesn't work. I don't know why no, I keep trying that. <laughs> Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, you may write us at mail at idiomatic.com or post a comment at idiomatic.com. We're also on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. We're also on iTunes. Please write us a review. It helps us a lot, believe it or not. And we'll talk to you next time. Yep. Yeah. Essentially, their action star, and yeah. she was a woman, yeah. and and a, a, a woman that was built like she could handle herself, which was a great casting choice. Yeah, and it's too bad she didn't want to stay. Indeed, um, you have a robot mm -hmm. data who's discovering humanity, so he's sort of a, the voice with which the other characters can share the enlightenment yeah. with without feeling as condescending to the audience as it might have otherwise. Yeah. Uh, he had, the, you know, a counselor that could feel emotions, so it was basically a crutch for bad writers to see, you know, I know you are feeling this, instead of having the characters be <laughs> able to express what he feels, you are feeling this now. Can uh, I just say, everybody slams Wesley Crusher with movies, and over at Don't F with the original, we talked about the original series, as well as the reboot by J.J. Abrams, but what we haven't talked about is a TV series from the 90s. I know. And now that the DVD for Star Trek Into Darkness, No Call and One Breath, is coming out, we thought it'd be the perfect occasion to come back and talk about the next generation. And all of its 
awesome spin-offs. Yes. Awesome is a strong word for these, but yes. <laughs> but we've got a lot of material to get through, so let's not waste any time and start with Star Trek The Next Generation. We'll get to it in an instant. Yeah. But for me, she is the worst character in oh, the series. Oh, she's terrible. She's terrible. And it's not the actress's fault. I think no. the actress is fine. It's just, it's such a bad idea for a character. Yeah. You know, make the extra effort and have your character be able to express by, you know, actions or even words and tone of voice how they're feeling not have the other character saying you are angry right now there's one funny scene where you know she goes to a clean and that I'm, I'm sensing a lot of anger from you and he's like oh you can't say that because you're telepathic he's like no from the table you broke it's like have characters break tables all the time if they're angry you don't need her at all although honestly <laughs> if, if, if 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 the crew was full of Fishing! they don't say that i don't know why they did that star trek the next generation yes now, that one is a weird one, because it started off with Gene Roddenberry reviving his series for ABC with a brand new crew in the 80s. Yeah. With a, a fairly old captain, where like I, yeah. I did not expect that at the time. Yeah, well, he's a captain. Captains, you get that by promotion, so expect them to be older. If for the action stuff, they had the first officer. Exactly, which, which was a sort of a normal concept, yeah, though. exactly. Yeah. You, know, it's, it, you know, it wasn't like all the same three characters all the time. You know, each different characters had different storylines. Yeah, and he's still going with the uh, acceptance thing. Like, we have a female officer who's chief of security, who's... Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Dreamer's Edge podcast. With Nicholas, I'm the gaming correspondent for Idiomatic. And I am Dimitri, uh, editor-in-chief of Idiomatic and movie critic. And you may be wondering, where's the rest of the crew? How come it's the don't fuck with the original uh, guys here? Well, that's because we've taken over. Yep, we rule. Now, back when Star Trek Into Darkness, No Call, and One Breath came out, we talked about the Star Trek movies, and then the Star Trek The Next Generation.